Why is it that something for simulating 3D environments is so useful for training machine learning algorithms? The beneficial thing about Unity isn't just that it can provide a lower level of abstraction, like in the good way, in that like it's more applicable to the thing it's eventually going to do, but also that you can watch it. We're using simulation to mean when we want to reinforcement learn something, teach it to perform some certain task. Whereas synthesis is where we want to make some data set that we then take out of engine and then apply using traditional machine learning models. Mars, bringer of war. Welcome to the podcast episode. Um, where in the world are you calling in from? I'm calling in from Hobart, Tasmania, which is like a little heart-shaped island state that hangs off the bottom of Australia, way down near Antarctica. And I understand as we are filming in June that for the Northern Hemisphere, this is summer. For you, it is something quite different. It's the dark of winter. When actually the city that I'm calling you from is famous for its midwinter festivals where they build big effigies and burn them and like harvest all the apple trees and make warm cider and like all the, the city is filled with these like red inverted crosses and every business what? has like turned their 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 lights red. It's yeah, it's this big thing. The whole island turns creepy in the dead inverted of winter. Inverted crosses. People come from all over the world to come and see a creepy festival. <laughs> <laughs> well that sounds like fun. And it it's chilly, fun. I guess. The skiing. Can yeah. you ski on Tasmania? No. So like yeah. We get this weird thing where, like, the planet is a bit smushed north, where we think we're quite <laughs> south. We're one of the southest, southest, southernmost uh, <laughs> land masses, significant land masses in the world. It's like us and Argentina, yeah. but yeah. we still aren't that far south. We're only 42 degrees south. So it's, we get right. snow up on our mountains, but we don't snow in the city. Right. It's an no extreme kidding. event Never. if you can get your skis out here. <laughs> Lots of inverted crosses, but no snow. Yes. Um, well, I, I would take that trade. Um, so we know each other through Suzanne Huston of O'Reilly. Um, Suzanne has been kind enough to introduce me to several great O'Reilly authors, such as yourself, and you are the first of those that she's introduced me to that is on the show. You have a book that is being released, I mean, digitally, right it was released... <laughs> Yeah, at the time of recording, and it seems like you're going to be able to get the book on Amazon, in the United States at least, as of today, the time that the episode is being released. So that's super cool. Your book is called Practical Simulations for Machine Learning, and you co-authored it with Harris Buffield Addison, who has the same last name as you by bizarre coincidence. Wait, no, 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 he is your husband. Uh, and, uh, also Tim Nugent and John Manning. So this is a super cool book. I loved going through it. I went through the preprint to study, <laughs> to study for, uh, for filming this episode. And I loved podcast it. Homework. Got, podcast homework. Yeah. That's actually most of my homework this day is podcast homework. <laughs> um, and, um, so it has three big sections. The first is on the basics of simulation and synthesis. And then the second big part is on simulating worlds for fun and profit, uh, which is a really fun um, title for a part of the book. And then the third and final part is on synthetic data and real results. So it seems like from these parts <laughs> and from the table of contents that there are two kinds of things that we're covering in this book. There are simulations and then there are synthetic data. So what are the two, what is the difference between those things? Can, do you use simulations to create synthetic data? Um, fill us in. So in this case, we're using simulation to mean when we want to reinforcement learn something, teach it to perform some certain task, to reach some certain goal state, uh, to animate when we haven't given a specific animation. Whereas synthesis is where we want to make some data set that we then take out of engine and then apply using traditional machine learning models to say that you're trying to make a model in a domain where you don't have enough data. It turns out that even if you create synthetic data based on the data you have, and even though you might intuit that that means it can only be derivative of what you have, why would that make it any better? It turns out it does. Mm. And all oh. of a sudden you have an infinite source of data. 
Wow. That is wild. I actually had a conversation many, many years ago, a phone call with this consulting company, and they they were talking to me about simulating financial data. And I, I thought it was a really bad idea. I should go back <laughs> and phone them. I think I was a bit snippy with them. Um, I actually often regret that phone call because I was kind of like, I was quite dismissive. Um, and yeah, it seems, it sounds like from what you just said, I made a big mistake that in fact, synthetic data can be hugely valuable. They can even be, yeah, provide you with uh, maybe even better data than, uh, than you could possibly collect in a particular situation. Well, if you only have limited input data, you're always going to be limited in what you can do. And there's only so far that you can stretch it. Obviously, anything you sim- simulate, uh, anything you synthesize is going to be just reinforcing whatever's there. So if you have right. something that's really messy or really ill-defined or something that's going to learn the wrong lesson, as we all know, machine learning is hard to wrangle sometimes. It learns the wrong thing. But if you're smart about how you use it and you're smart about the random variations that you introduce, that that source of chaos then right. yeah, you can make something that's really robust. That's cool. Yeah. And as you say, infinite amounts of it, then if you can simulate your synthetic data, then you can theoretically have as much as you need. Um, so this is something, for example, that we see with uh, self-driving cars. There's a lot of self-driving car footage out there of really boring situations. So going straight down a highway, <laughs> self-driving cars collect lots and lots of data that show that, but yeah. there isn't really anything that needs to be learned, particularly in that case. What we want to be learning is the irregular circumstances. When a pedestrian jumps out in front of the road or a cow jumps in front of the road, or you're in a city with all kinds of things going on. And um, so a lot of self-driving car companies simulate data of the um, kind of edge cases so that you have lots of examples of training data to, um, train self-driving cars on so that's, that's kind of one <laughs> um yeah that's one that kind of uh that i was kind of aware of before uh, going through your book um so in your book you guys rely heavily on something called unity so what is unity why was that so useful for the simulations that you did in your book well unity is actually a game development engine and so if you think about when you want to make video games and quite often they're complex 3d worlds nowadays you don't want every time you're writing a game to have to write the physics system like if you want someone to be able to chuck a cube or hold the weapon or push a button you don't want to have to program how something is going to arc and fall how things are going to ricochet how light works so you, you can want use the one of these to wiggle properly yeah. Uh, you you want to skip all that and you want it to be consistent across different platforms. So we get these things called game engines. Uh, and there are two really big popular ones, but there are a bunch of open source ones. So the two popular ones are Unreal Engine, which you might know is the thing mm. that everyone used to make Fortnite uh, and most recently has been used for films, feature films, as they, they've got that that volume technology that they, they're getting on, that they're making all these uh, digital sets, virtual sets. For films, oh, cool. Uh, and their competitor is Unity, which is a game development engine that mostly is used for mobile games and is the one that like Pokemon Go is built in. Hmm. And I guess because their competitor had gotten into films, which is a bigger market than games, Unity was like, "crap, well, we better find our second market." <laughs> and they found out that people were using Unity to simulate their robots that they could then make work in a lab. So. Obviously, if you can simulate something in a computer, it can try things out and fail and try again and learn much, much faster than it would be able to in the real world. And better yet, you can parallelize it. So if you have a robot arm who's trying to learn how to pick up a cube and you're trying to do that with a real robot, that's quite difficult to do. You have to wait for that thing to try and fail and try and fail. But in a computer, you can make a million of them that can try a billion times a minute. And people had managed to hack this together themselves. And now you need to decide to go whole hog and support it officially. Yeah, that is one of the, uh, when I wrote my book, Deep Learning Illustrated, the, of the three main reinforcement learning engines that you could use, um, one was provided by OpenAI, another one was provided by Google DeepMind, and then the third was Unity. Um, oh. So you know, even years ago, they were big in that space. So um, What's the relationship 
between Unity and learning algorithms? Like, why, why is it that something for simulating 3D environments is so useful for training machine learning algorithms, particularly reinforcement learning algorithms like these robot arms that you're describing? Uh, so is this something to do, is this relationship between Unity and these reinforcement learning algorithms, these learning algorithms uh, related to the way that Unity can represent things visually and spatially? Yes. So obviously it makes the most sense if you're trying to simulate something that's trying to solve a visual or spatial problem, specifically if you're trying to make something that will be translated into the real world for a physical thing. So you want to make a robot that assembles cars, you would have to get the physicality of that represented in the environment that it's learning in. So you want the thing it's picking up to have weight, to be slippery. And all of those those physical aspects are really hard if you're trying to make an abstract representation of that without a full physics simulation, which Unity has. But also you can abstract kind of other kinds of problems into something visual. So the really beneficial thing about Unity isn't just that it can provide a lower level of abstraction, like in the good way, in that like it's more applicable to the thing it's eventually going to do, but also that you can watch it. It's very easy to see when your model has mm. gone awry or is doing something weird when you've got a physical environment that has cameras in it that shows you snapshots of what it's doing. When you're watching something learn, you can see when it's gone weird, which is often the hard part about machine learning is That's when cool. something's out learning the wrong things, it's gone off the rails, but you're just trying to look at like a tensor graph and you have no idea. This episode is brought to you by Super Data Science, our online membership platform for learning data science at any level. Yes, the platform is called Super Data Science. It's the namesake of this very podcast. In the platform, you'll discover all of our 50 plus courses, which together provide over 300 hours of content, with new courses being added on average once per month. All of that and more you get as part of your membership at Super Data Science. So don't hold off, sign up today at www.superdatascience.com. Secure your membership and take your data science skills to the next level. Yeah, I can, I, I don't have very much experience with reinforcement learning and watching algorithms learn. Uh, most of my experience is through a simple 2D game called the cart pole game. Um, <laughs> but even with, so with the cart pole game, you control a cart <laughs> that can move left or right. That's it. And um, there's a, there's a vertical pole that you're trying to balance on top of the cart. And the game starts where the pole is slightly off balance to the left or to the right. But if you can quickly move your cart, you can get the pole to balance above, but the pole is always kind of wobbling over. It's 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 very easy for it to fall over. So you're constantly shifting the cart left and right to make the pole stand up. And it's a very it's a really simple 2D game to test how well um, reinforcement learning algorithms are learning. And it is really cool watching that algorithm learn. So I imagine that you have uh, much more you know, much more depth and breadth of experience with these kinds of visualizations uh, just does some particularly cool 3d visualizations spring to mind for you of some uh, algorithm that you have seen learn or not learn effectively i don't know I, i'm always the most satisfied with the things where we're teaching them to do procedural animation so you have like some sort of little figure uh and you want it to learn something usually to observe how it learns and so there's this quite interesting field of uh computational biology or I can't think what the alternative word is. There's another term for that field. But basically, they want to examine how we have evolved and how different animals have evolved. And they thought that they could simulate it and we could learn something about it. So you end up with these simulations like you give it some constraints, like here is a entity and it has the ability to consume things for food and reproduce mm. and change what it physically looks like. So let's give it something to optimize for, say survival, and just let it go. And like we can see something interesting in that, like whatever final form it establishes, we can say that that has some utility that that is in some ways ideal for the objectives it has. And so we also ended up with like if we make a bipedal form that's similar to a human form and we give it like the concept of energy and the concept of locomotion and we tell it to propel itself forward, but we don't tell it how a human walks, how will it learn to walk? Is that more efficient than the way we walk? 
Uh, and you get some really interesting things where like if you don't give it a cost for energy, so it's not trying to conserve energy, then what they start doing is they start punching forward. They like <laughs> uh, they do this little run where they 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 punch their fists forward like a little windmill. Uh, and it's because it turns out that that's really efficient for forward momentum. If you're not trying to conserve energy, that's maybe how we would all be walking, oh. running and fist pumping the whole way. <laughs> that's cool. That was a really wonderful example. A great visual example. Um, so when you're working with Unity and you're making simulations, I guess in your book and probably in a lot of cases in the real world, the kind of glue that we would be using to get going in Unity would be Python, maybe PyTorch? Yeah. Well, Unity nice. has this ML agents framework. And basically all it does is it opens it into process bridge that can be hooked into with Python. So you can use it with any Python framework you can imagine. You can write your own. You can do like your own hand-coded perceptrons if you want to. It's just hooking into that engine and it's giving you the ability to feed it inputs and receive outputs. So you can make it talk to whatever you like, whatever you can conceive of in Python. Speaking of hand coding, <laughs> yes. before we started filming, <laughs> you described to me a really fun idea, which is that you could use a Unity video game simulation to have a completely visual video game-like um, I'm going to use the word visual again, visualization <laughs> yeah. of a neural network learning. <laughs> so you could yes. have, you were describing like, you could have like barrels representing weights increasing or biases yeah. increasing. And like some big Rube Goldberg them. machine of like little balls that like roll down <laughs> in ways and then pulled out in weights or something. Yeah. It would be horribly inefficient, but it would be interesting to watch. Because I keep saying, like, you can abstract anything into a visual spatial problem, and you can. It's not a good idea sometimes, but you can. Yeah, and so that's actually one of the main points of your book, is that not only can we be using these simulated bots to be doing things in a visual or spatial environment, say a 3D environment, to do work for us, but a central tenet of your book is that you could also convert other kinds of problems into a visual um, realm, just like we described this neural network. You could convert it into yeah, barrels rolling and uh, moving uh, ropes and those are controlling weights and uh, you could watch a neural network learn in this visual spatial way. So um, yeah, and then you could have these bots do, do anything to solve any kind of problem, theoretically, even though it is potentially less efficient in some cases. But maybe there's the upside of visualization. Um, like you said earlier, this uh, we, you know, we often don't know what's going wrong. So if we're just watching our cost functions go down in, uh, in some kind of board. Visual, intensive board, yeah, would be the most common choice. Um, we don't really have a sense of what's going on. We just know that it didn't work. So we hope that by reinitializing with random weights again and sampling in a different that. order, <laughs> yeah, just don't do that again. Um, or maybe we, we, we decrease our learning rate or something like that. But if we could see what's going on, if we could say, oh, no, the barrels over there in the Tasmania region of my visualization are, they're all breaking and shattering. Yeah. Uh, upside down crosses all over the place. That's we really notice this want. even with like the most <laughs> simple simulations. Like like you're saying like cart pole, there's like the 3D equivalent, which is that like it it controls a plate and there's a ball that's on it and it has to keep the ball on top. So it same way it has to like jiggle and jitter and balance. Mm -hmm. and what do they call that ball the ball plate game? <laughs> I don't even know. I think it's just balance. Uh, uh, but they we occasionally I've done something where even I made like the most minimal simulation. I've like hooked it up wrong. Like the, the actions are in backwards or something. And like the tense graph looks right. like it's kind of getting there for the first 10 minutes or something. Uh, but you'll watch it and it's acting weird. And so you go, no, 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 I've done something wrong. And so like, we know it's useful because right. we use it already. We see things go weird. The bipeds are all running around punching the air. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, anyway, so silly example, but um all right, so we've learned a lot about your book and about simulating data and then using those synthesized data uh, and training machine learning models. We've learned about how we can be uh, either using the simulated data for 
solving visual spatial problems or contriving visual spatial problems to take advantage of these kinds of uh, simulation techniques. Do you have any particular examples from the book or from your life experience as to how um, we can use these simulated data practically? Yeah, well, we still have those two halves where like if you're looking for purely simulation based, it's usually things like self-driving cars. It means right. you want to be able to have something drive around in a place where if it stuffs up, it's not going to hurt someone. So right. typically you would make like a, a, a street environment and you would have simulated pedestrians and they're crazy and they walk all over the streets and there are things down in their way. And right. you can also use this to make inputs so that you wouldn't be able to in real data. So like one of the examples we show is you've made like a city that this car can drive around in and it's got cameras on its front and then it has to conduct itself appropriately. But then one of the other inputs that it can receive as part of its uh, feedback is like a map where its inputs have been keyed by what layer that thing is. So it's like a version of its camera input, but it's like all the trees are purple and all the pedestrians are green. And this is like a layer key. So it starts to understand what it's looking at. So it knows as it's driving around, it's not only, it's kind of learning those road rules and proper conduct, conduct and what it's looking at in parallel. And you don't have to go around tagging things yourself because it's in a game engine. It can just query the object that's there and go, oh, what are you? Oh, you're a pedestrian. Cool. And you can get things like it's teaching itself depth because it can guess how far away something is and you don't have to go and measure it. It gets the reinforcement of the engine just goes, it's exactly this far away because it knows it has entire control over the environment and everything in it. And he knows everything in it and where it is and what its properties are. So complete knowledge of the environment that you don't have to manufacture or measure yourself. But you also yeah. get with the synthesis side, it's more for like if you have something that's tedious or totally infeasible to do. So one of the examples we have are like you're trying to teach something to identify a dice roll. So you roll a die and it tells you what, what side is up. And so, yes, you could go around taking photos, 10 billion photos of dice in all different lighting environments with all different colored dice, all different sizes of dice, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can put them in a 3D engine and then give it the axes to randomize, where the axes to randomize are the materials, the lighting, where they are, relation to the camera, et cetera. And it can make you all of a sudden an infinite number of those. Maybe more varied than you would have been able to produce in real life, which means it's going to be quite robust in its ability to detect different things. And that's also good for like, you want it to identify trees. You can randomly generate trees. That's really easy. You can make an infinite number of trees and you don't have to go around taking pictures of trees. And yes, they will only work to a point because they are simulated, but just adding in a little bit of real world data actually makes it surprisingly effective. Very cool. I love those examples. Um, yeah, so it sounds like there's a huge amount of value for listeners, for data scientists, to be learning about these kinds of community game engine driven simulations and synthetic data. Very cool. And it seems like a super fun book with lots of hands on practical examples. Um, but this is not your only book. <laughs> so you also previously wrote a book called Practical AI with Swift. Uh, and that was also with uh, with the same co-author team. Is that right? It was Paris, uh, yes. Tim Mugent, and, and John Manning as well for that one. And so what's that about? So some most listeners have probably heard of the Swift programming language, but maybe you should uh, give us a couple sentences on Swift first. And then why would we want to be doing practical artificial intelligence with Swift? Yeah, so Swift is a programming language that came out of Apple, and it's what you make like iOS and macOS apps in. It's a successor to their Objective-C language, and it's still something that can compile down to C. It's very portable, very powerful. It's often akin to, often compared to Rust as a really good language for like systems programming. It's really elegant. I really like it. It's liked by a lot of the same people that like Go, which is the similar thing that uh, Google has produced because I guess a lot of big companies reach that point at once where they're like, we want our own modern programming language. And so we got yeah. all, a bunch of good ones at once. And so Swift is awesome. The thing about Swift is it's what people use to write iOS apps. And iOS apps were kind of getting this renaissance where like 
it really got to a point where like basically half the people on the planet had an iPhone in their pocket that was capable of doing advanced augmented reality, of doing photogrammetry, of doing like on device really intense learning. Like you can do on device neural style transfer in an app you can whip up in five minutes. And yeah, it was just like all of a sudden everyone has these really powerful capable devices in their pockets. And yet even then, when we think about machine learning, we think about big, complex, academic things written in Python and not fun little apps on an iPhone that you can try yourself. And especially that like iPhone development was a big area that had a lot of attention, particularly from like younger programmers. And we just wanted to show them that they could start putting smarts. They could start putting machine learning into their apps really easily. So yeah, we wrote another book. Uh, this was two years ago, because I guess you can tell by now that my interest is like... <laughs> taking frameworks that people don't usually use for machine learning and showing how you can use it for machine learning. And I would write 10 million books on that topic with all different weird and wonderful <laughs> things if I could. But it was just about showing the fun things. So again, it was more like a cookbook in structure where it was like 20 different apps that did all different things and looked at all the different things you could do on device with an iPhone. You can recognize people and you can put memoji uh, on their faces and you can do uh, detect drawings and stuff. And so it's yeah, very similar in structure to now the practical simulations with machine learning, which is you can make little agents do this and that and this. Um, and they're both very visual, very creative. So, yeah, I think they're very similar, even though the technologies that they're about are completely disparate. <laughs> right. Yeah, that makes sense. So with your current book that's coming out now, you're using the Unity game engine to simulate data. Um, but previously, you were using Swift to do machine learning on devices um, on things like iPhones and iPads. Um, that's super cool. Um, and I like that thread that you drew between them, which I hadn't thought of myself. Um, that's wonderful. And it's also interesting that you mentioned that you could do a million books <laughs> because it seems like you might be on track to, in your lifetime, do about a million books. <laughs> um, while you only have two so far, uh, the gentlemen that you have co-authored it with, Harris, Tim, and John, they have authored dozens so of many. books already. Tell us a bit about um, some of the books that they've written. Yeah, so they also kind of stumbled into it. They were like at a party sometime with someone that was <laughs> writing this book series about Objective C, I think, at the time, which was then the, the precursor language that people were using to write iPhone apps when they first came out. And this was somebody who had written like the first two or three editions of a book. And he's like, oh, I don't really want to write the next one. And they're like, we'll do it. And so <laughs> they got there into writing with like writing. Um, well, they started writing with O'Reilly Media by writing like a fourth edition of a book or something. And it turns out they were like, fantastic. Someone you can do like iPhones because historically, even though iPhones and Swift and Apple related technologies are quite big in the real world, they actually haven't had mm -hmm. much of O'Reilly uh, O'Reilly's audience. And it's weird oh. that when we look at the analytics of the platform, it's not reflected in O'Reilly's audience that like Swift has been like a weird side thing. And their demographic of iOS programmers particularly is much, much lower than we observe in the real world. Huh. So they're like in this little niche where they're among, I think only three sets of authors who write about Swift and Apple stuff under the O'Reilly banner, which is both a blessing and a curse that, that yeah, it's quite <laughs> right. niche. The, the couple of people who are into Swift and into the O'Reilly learning platform, they don't have many options. They're very good to us. But yeah, there, there are not as many as you would think. But it's really fun. They've also written all of the, well, most of the books that O'Reilly has released about the Unity game engine, just from a, a game development perspective. And they've also, also done some fun little side things about like the, Swift Pocket Reference, which is this cute tiny little book, and like how to write apps for the Apple Watch and how to make games with GameKit on iPhones and stuff. So there's also like the crossover between the two. Super cool. Yeah. So between them coming up from game dev and me coming up through machine learning, we just kind of met in the middle and started writing about how you can use game technologies for machine learning. Do you happen to have a, another book? Uh, that you're thinking about for the future that you can share with us on air? Oh, I we actually had a book cancelled recently. We wanted oh. to write uh, about the Swift for TensorFlow project, which was 
So the person who made Swift, who was working, he wrote LLVM as like his thesis and he started working for Apple uh, making Swift. And then he went to work for Google and Google went fantastic. So kind of outgrowing Python, like there's, there are some limitations to what you can do with Python for machine learning. We really want to have like yeah. a, a strongly typed, truly really modern, fast language, uh, particularly compiled language. We're going to start porting TensorFlow to something like that. What are our options? Oh, we've got Chris Latner. Let's do Swift. And they started the Swift for TensorFlow project, and they had yeah. started porting all of TensorFlow to Swift. But more importantly, they also made a bridge where you could just call into arbitrary Python code from Swift. So you could import Python libraries, and you could use Python types. And so you could kind of wrap your Python-based libraries that were already there with like some extra strength and robustness from Swift and particularly error handling from Switch, Swift, which was really good. And so we decided to write a book on this and we started writing a book on this and then Google killed the project, <laughs> as Google <laughs> oh, no. tends to do. And so uh, you know, we, we just started and like obviously the project still exists, there's nothing stopping you from using it, but it's not going to get ongoing development. So it wasn't worth writing a whole thing to tell people that they should switch all their TensorFlow stuff to the Swift, Swift version. If it doesn't really have a future as a project, unfortunately, it went the way uh, of Google uh, Wave and my <laughs> beloved Google Inbox. Yes, I've griped for so a... long on air about the loss of Google Inbox before and the hours of productivity I lose every week because of that. But uh, I won't do it again now. I've done it enough. <laughs> now we can commiserate together. The, the, <laughs> you loved the Inbox anti too. Google, anti, anti Google fan club. Uh, yeah, no, they, they but they, they do allowed. have a tendency to kill kill products that we rely on. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have my local congressperson draft a bill that means that <laughs> it will really will really make the economy more efficient by not allowing widely used free products from ever being canceled. <laughs> you must maintain them forever, and we'll have this perfect economy where nothing. Yeah, we'll never have any I inefficiencies again. <laughs> how they decide to kill things that's the, that's the weird thing it's not that they kill things like every tech company kills things but they're just like out of left fields like you don't see it coming you can't look at the like usage patterns of a particular product and be like yeah they're gonna ax that they ax it randomly it's so strange uh, <laughs> i have a hypothesis which is that it's monetization and yeah. so yeah, one of the sense. really wonderful things about google inbox was it was so minimalist including it didn't have any ads <laughs> and there was no yeah. way for ads to kind of get into your inbox. Um, so that was that's my guess for that one. But uh, don't even get anyway. me started. I have like my my old Linux beard tirade that I can go on about how they've ruined email <laughs> the spec by adding all of these UI UI layers that people don't understand, like red receipts <laughs> that doesn't exist in the email spec. You're faking it. And you're making people think that that is part of email. Um, Do you know how they give you red red receipts in emails? They put a little pixel at the end that is actually right. an image that you have to hit a web server to load. So right. when you open the email, it hits the web server right. and goes, ah, you've read that, and then sends the red right. receipt to the other end. It's not part of an email. They're just stalking you weirdly. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's probably the only way that Google is stalking us weirdly. Um <laughs> <laughs> um so uh yeah so so that book was unfortunately canceled um tensorflow for swift yeah. boo but if i could else? write anything a book about anything yeah. i would yeah i guess try to contrive something more about the space work that i'm doing just because space is cool everyone uh, thinks space okay. is cool that's universally yeah. known <laughs> perfect and so you're segued right into my next question so you're doing a phd um, yes. despite all these other things that we've already talked about you doing, <laughs> um, writing lots of books and we've got a lot of more things still to cover on the show that things that you do all at the same time. Uh, but one of those things is a PhD <laughs> and that PhD is about space. So you're making tools for the detection, tracking and classification of space junk. And yes. so there's a lot of junk hanging around in space in low earth orbit. And so you're doing a PhD with CSIRO, C-S-I-R-O which is Australia's premier scientific research organization. And I know that there are lots of things that you can't tell us about what you do in your secret space junk projects, um, but um, maybe there are some things you can tell us about this kind of this PhD work that you're doing. Yeah. Well, so CSIRO is like the, the National Laboratories kind of 
mixed with the NRAO kind of equivalent in Australia. So they own most of the radio telescopes uh, and they've let me use some of those for my PhD. So the topic is kind of like most people nowadays have heard of the space debris crisis. So they've seen the movie Gravity and they've heard of Kessler syndrome. So they know that there's junk in space. You know, we've been putting junk up there since the 50s. And the, we don't. The bit in gravity where space junk hits whatever the space station that we're in or whatever, that is, is. one of the most frightening parts in the movie. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, it brought a lot of attention to it, actually. It's been really quite effective as outreach because everyone's like, uh-huh. oh, yes, like the movie, that Sandra Bullock movie. Now I know. So it's actually been great. But yeah, it's, it's easy for me. Like, it, I, it was very easy for me to remember about space junk because I always think about that time that I pooped my pants in theater. That I had to, I'm like, oh yeah, that time that I pooped in my pants, space junk. <laughs> oh, no. I didn't actually poop in my pants, I promise. But uh, but that was, I mean, gravity was a stunningly, um, I bet it happened to someone out there. <laughs> it was a stunningly intense film. Visceral, yes. Indeed. Well, yeah, so like um, we know that yeah. we put stuff up there in orbit. And for a long time, we just went, oh, well, space is big. They won't go near each other. It won't matter. And right. we ended up having this this Don Kessler who was doing simulations about how asteroid fields form based on these cascade collisions. So, like, one asteroid will hit another asteroid and it'll break parts off and they'll hit other asteroids. And that's how you end up with, like, given a certain amount of time, eventually a, the size of asteroids in an asteroid belt was largely homogenized because they will have all ground each other down. And anything that's much larger than something else would end up being broken apart because of the speeds evolved, et cetera, et cetera. And he started going, hey, what about these things that we keep putting in space that's nearer to us? Satellites, what's up with those? And he figured out that if you look at it in the same way, that because satellites, yes, there are relatively few of them in a very big space, but they end up in similar kinds of orbits. And particularly now when we look at what's fit for purpose, we want things to be in particular orbits, then they actually do get close enough that they can hit each other. And there are cases where they have spectacularly hit each other because you've got to think about how something in low Earth orbit is moving like 10 times the speed of a bullet. So something that's this wow. like millimeters big can take out a much, much larger object. So on average, if wow. one piece of junk hits something else and it breaks apart, it will create about 10 other pieces that are capable of doing the same mass destruction as the original, which means wow. you do and get everyone- this cascade effect. That if Every something hits while. something the wrong way, it could flow on and that could hit something and that could hit something and we could have a uh, ablation cascade in orbit, which will make orbit unusable. We won't be able to have satellites anymore. We won't get space exploration. We'll just be surrounded in a fast moving field of shards. It's rather important to keep that, an eye on. <laughs> that kind of seems like what we deserve at this point. I mean, we're just, we don't, we don't worry about enough things. We just keep like creating carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and producing more styrofoam. And it just seems like that's, that's the future that <laughs> that we've earned. A very it's human just, thing. Yeah. We're just going to fill the space with junk, make it completely unusable. And, and some people, some States are, are helping us along by every once in a while firing a rocket at a satellite and just oh, yeah. making sure that they can do that. Like Russia did that in, in November and we've had a few yeah. other times where, like, I think China and India have also done anti-satellite weapons tests. I, those are the countries and, I was thinking of. Yeah. And, yeah, and every time the U.S. goes, oh, like, my goodness, cannot believe they have done this. There should be laws about this when the U.S. has done more of this than anyone else. Like, call right. up Project Starfish when they were nuking the atmosphere just to see if they could. <laughs> like, right. They've been doing it for decades. They had that... Uh, there's this really awesome photograph of one of the first anti-satellite missile tests that was done by the US, which wasn't a like truck-based, land-based missile, like a little rocket, like you would think of. Like the Chinese ASAT test was like a, a, a truck-mounted rocket. Uh, the first one that the US did was actually on a fighter plane. They got someone to fly Mark 1 straight up and fire at a satellite in orbit, <laughs> and he hit it. <laughs> Wow. Crazy. Is, and someone got a photo of it. It's awesome. Uh, but yeah, they no one's ever attacked another country's satellites, but they attack their own just to show they can, just so no one right. messes with them. Back off. So, okay. 
So we kind of understand the space junk problem really well now. Yeah. And so uh, does what you do in your PhD have anything to do with machine learning or what are you up to? Well, it was supposed to, uh, but actually, so it's in this domain called s- space domain awareness or space situational awareness, or is sometimes called space traffic management or space surveillance. It has lots of different terms because it's rather new and that's how fields work. When they're, they're brand new, everyone makes <laughs> their own names. And so similar to like we have air traffic control for planes, which has to keep track of where all the planes are, where they're going, what their objectives are, and then try to route them so that they all get to meet their objectives without running into each other. We have to do a similar thing for satellites. So because we don't have any robust, scalable, really well-developed to maturity solutions for going up there and grabbing debris and bringing it back down, which even if we could, we could only do that for like low Earth orbit. We've got things out at Lagrange points that we're just never, ever going to be able to get them. So if we can't remove debris, the best thing we can do is know where it is and try to move things out of the way if they're about to hit, which means that all over the world, we have sensors that look at the sky and keep, try to keep track of the you know, 5,000 active satellites, the 35,000 large debris objects, down to like the like 130 million, we think, maybe of tiny fragments of debris that are wow. out there. But the worst thing is that orbits aren't stable. Like you'd think you would put something in an orbit and it will stay there, but it turns out that's not right. the case because the sun oh. does stuff which creates pressure around Earth. And we've got these like charged particle belts that like push things outwards. And also like when something's in low Earth orbit, they drag along the top of the atmosphere, which means they slowly skew. And it means that actually we need to re-identify and re-plot the trajectory of every object, basically every 24 hours, or it will be completely wrong. And also at this distance, if we can't figure out where it's going to be, we probably won't even be able to find it again. So oh my God. it's a constant, constant chase. And we're trying to get better and better at predicting their trajectories, given what we know about the physical forces at work. But they're so complicated and we can't do it fast enough. And we don't have enough radars I had no idea. to pick everything. So actually, my, my work slots into the more instrumental side of things, uh, where in, in astronomy, you have the people who are instrumentalists, who are the ones who work with the, the sensors, the, the in, instruments. And so assuming that one radar to look at space can cost a billion dollars and take five years to build, and we need them all over the world and enough of them to keep up with the growing rate of satellites in space, we went, oh, crap, we obviously can't build them fast enough. What can we use? Well, we have radio telescopes. But Mm. astronomical radio telescopes are made to look at deep, deep space. So if you get an array of them and all of the algorithms they use assume that there is basically an angular difference of zero because something is so far away it's like if you look with your two eyes at something really really far away your two eyes are basically seeing the same thing but if you look at something that's here all right. of a sudden what your different eyes are seeing is looks quite different so right. i started out thinking that i would be working in machine learning to try and get better at like predicting those orbits and also identifying what object we are seeing because yeah. if we're not using optical we're using radios we have to identify it based on transmissions alone Uh, But now I've ended up looking at how we can adapt radio telescopes that were designed for astronomy, be able to see things right at the end of their noses, which means reframing the algorithms they use to like account for Earth's rotation while they're observing and account for Doppler shift and all these complicated electromagnetic things, some of which are beyond my grasp. It's quite hard. (laughs) Uh, Well, it sounds fascinating. And so you've ended up not so much doing machine learning in your PhD like you anticipated, but instead high-performance computing. So taking advantage yeah. of your of your very strong programming background. I love GPU programming. So <laughs> it's it's the fun little package. If you haven't ever done GPU programming, the easiest way to explain it is that you have to pass everything you want the GPU to do in one neat little package. You have to say, here is the like million data points that we want you to operate on, and here is the operation that we want you to perform, and here is the hardware context that you're going to operate in and here is where you put your results and you have to like pass these little these little chunks and i guess it's slightly closer to the metal than typical cpu programming and yeah it's really fun and the kinds of speed up you can get is crazy so is that like cuda that you, that you end up using a lot of or something else yeah, yeah cuda i mean you can do like um, uh open clc but everyone has basically decided on the nvidia as the default now that we've got the awesome like 3090s Nice. So NVIDIA GPUs with the CUDA software on them. 
Um, yeah, doing high performance computing to detect space junk. That's super cool. So yeah, you are clearly a super strong programmer. I mean, you have, oh, you already have degrees in it. <laughs> yes. And now you're working on the highest degree, a PhD in uh, computer engineering. Um, so a little bit before we started recording, you and I were talking about different routes into data science. And so you have gotten into data science from programming. Yes. And I have many times on air said how the most valuable skills for data scientists to have are programming skills. And part of what drives my strong conviction behind this is that when we have guests on air who are the CEOs or heads of data science of fast growing startups or big companies like NVIDIA, they are sometimes hiring data scientists. They are always, 100% of the time, <laughs> they're hiring uh, software engineers. So these could be tangentially related to data science roles. It could be machine learning engineers or data engineers, but those kinds of roles are more in demand than just being, I guess what you could call a pure data scientist that is just developing models based on data that have already been provided to them. And then they don't have to worry about the production implementation downstream. And so, um, so yeah, so I think, you know, people can come into data science from a lot of different ways. I think that, coming from a programming background like yours can be the most valuable in today's um, job climate. And it sounds like you even, you run into lots of scenarios as a PhD student where people value you hugely because of that programming background. In physics, definitely. There's a lot of that, uh, what we call science science coding, whether people have come up through the sciences and at a certain point in their degree they've or in their career or in academia, all of a sudden it's like, now you need to write your own models. And they're like, well, crap, I've never written a program in my life. And they quickly learn Python and they write these like single scripts that have no documentation, no command line arguments. They comment out bits of code to get different command flow. Uh, and it's really monstrous for the repeatability of science. But at the same time, I appreciate that, like, if that's what gets it done, like, not everyone has time to be amazing <laughs> open source maintainers who makes a whole project out of every little script they make. So, like, at a certain point, you just need to get it done. And if that's what makes research happen, that's fine. And the same thing, like, I really appreciate the skills that learning computer science has given me. And I love my programming background. I love it deeply. But at the same time, I also don't necessarily agree that it's objectively the best way. Like data scientists <laughs> of all kinds, I can tell you that like the programmers I know care not at all about statistics. And every time they have to do something data-y, they just pick, pick the first approach they find in Google for whatever keywords they got. And right. so like in some ways that people who have come from like a more statistics background, or even nowadays you can study specifically data science, they are going to have different skill sets and both is good. And you can always teach yourself the other thing. I think it's slightly easier for you to teach yourself programming when you're surrounded by programmers than it is for you to teach yourself a deep understanding of math. So if you have to study one at university, maybe pick the one that you're going to learn more from other people than just by trying yourself. So Cool. Well, that Everyone was a good of all kinds. Coming from. <laughs> Yeah, there's lots of space for all different kinds of data scientists out there. Um, surely, however, we can agree that regardless, developing both of these things then would be wonderful. Yeah. So whether you, whatever background you came from, it could be completely different from programming or statistics um, or math. Uh, people come into data science from all kinds of places and you can become hugely valuable by learning software development skills, programming skills, as well as, uh, yeah, these mathematical things, statistical things, linear algebra, calculus, probability theory, statistical inference, um, all, all useful. And in your decades-long data science career listener, you might as well have some fun rounding them all out. Um, and yeah, becoming a full-stack data scientist, as I've called them before on air. Cool. I think the thing that remains consistent is like, the curiosity. People get into data science because they want to answer questions. And sometimes I see data scientists that have come from like policy backgrounds and stuff because they just they want to know 
how something works. Like you often get people who have come to data science from like sociology because they just they want to observe these different phenomena. And I, th- I think it's fantastic. That's one of the things I love about data science as a field. It's, it's just the only thing that unites us is like curiosity and Python. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, no. Our listener, cover your ears. <laughs> um, <laughs> the last episode that we filmed was at the New York R Conference, live on stage, Mars. It was pretty cool. Huh. Um, I love R. I think that... R is a nicer language, but Python is slightly easier to interface with other things. So if you're just trying to do like analysis oh, totally. and you do it now, if you need to talk to like another system or to like output in yeah. like HTTP or talk to a server or something, then you're just going to have a hard time doing that with R. Or MATLAB is the other thing that they, they're getting people into in university. Learn this yeah. highly proprietary ecosystem. You will not be able to yeah. take these skills anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Professionally, we don't see that as much though. Uh, you you probably still get exposed to that a lot because you're PhD, but yeah, I don't know. And you I don't teach see a lot of that. Any. Maybe uh, my favorite part of my job is I I teach the wee baby like artificial intelligence 101 and also introduction to data science, which oh. is everyone's first. Oh my god, you can answer questions with an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> it's actually really fun, like getting them to res- respect these tools that like I don't know. There's a lot of ego in first year computer science that they're like. <laughs> bunch of 18 year old boys who have taught themselves to program and making their own compilers and stuff and then they come and learn and they think they're amazing and then there are certain things that they just don't think about especially in like human factors where it's like let's think about not how we can make this amazing system that's like a technological marvel but that it works is like really fit for purpose for the humans that are going to need to use the system mm-hmm. and the same thing in data science they come in with a lot of ego where they're like what like we're going to use excel like like <laughs> office ladies do. That's a, a tool for like basic, uh, basic the the concept, not basic the language. <laughs> but, to basic, but, uh, highly numerate people. <laughs> yes, but we uh, yeah, we break down those things and we talk about how like you can use any tool to answer questions, and I think that's a really fundamental thing. It's really fun. We get to get, like one of the t- classes I teach uses Prolog, and everyone's like, no one uses Prolog nowadays. I'm like, yeah, but it teaches really important things. It's amazing to do. It's great fun. Um, what do you use Prolog for? What does it do? Uh, it's like a, a symbolic execution kind of language where you can give it like a set of uh, premises and a goal state and it will like work through all the different options. Have you seen Prolog, the language? No. Weirdly, the thing that it ends up still being used for in production is like airline systems because you can give it a rule like uh, Jane is Bob's mum, and Tom is Jane's dad, and someone being the parent of someone else who is a parent of someone else makes them their grandparent. So, what is Tom to Bob? A grandparent. Right. Uh, so, right. basically, they they do all these like iterative things. You can use it for like procedural stories because you can say that like there are these characters that exist and these actions that they have access to. And these motivations, given these actions, how can these characters achieve their goals? And it will execute all the different variants. It's very powerful. That's cool. I didn't know that. Um, Going back a little bit, one could argue that in addition to curiosity, the language that unites, the thing that unites all data scientists is SQL. (laughs) Yeah. Which, Yeah. Which really, everyone uses SQL. Oh, well, everyone's getting to like the the no SQL now. It's very hard to have not SQL. <laughs> I really like um, it. I, I I have a deep passion for domain specific programming languages and all programming languages. Like we talked earlier about how I love LaTeX, uh, and you know a lot of telescope software is still written in like Fortran and. Like we did make modern programming languages for a reason. They have their purpose, but also knowing why these older and especially really hyper domain specific languages were made it's really interesting and like recently i was writing a library that was about ingesting enormous amounts of telescope data and we're looking at well we need to be able to stream data in and it's always going to be too big to live in memory and all of a sudden i'm back to reading about how like database query languages work because they have a real strength in getting a bunch of data because what they do is they like structure a query in advance so they do a bunch of optimizations about what parts they'll even need to load into memory before they even know what that is. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden we're using like SQL approaches in telescope software. 
Cool. That's the beauty of computer science. Taking approaches wow. from everywhere and putting them everywhere. <laughs> I'm so glad that I brought it up. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, when I was researching for this episode, I came across that on LinkedIn, you had recently posted yourself as well as, I believe, several of the co-authors of the books, Practical Simulations for Machine Learning and Practical AI with Swift that we've already talked about, um, all together in an office with an Australian member of parliament. Um, and so that MP was visiting the secret lab. Yes. So <laughs> not the what chair is the company, lab? the and... other one. <laughs> <laughs> not the what company? There, there's a... a... A series of gaming chairs that like like Twitch streamers and stuff have these like really fancy expensive office chairs that are oh. made by a company called Secret Lab that's newer than our Secret Lab, but has oh. definitely become the more famous Secret Lab. There's also a third Secret Lab that is like a special <laughs> effects company that you sometimes see come up in the credits of like sci-fi movies. And there's countless yeah. secret Secret Labs out there that we don't even know about yet. <laughs> yes. Um, but so your your well known secret lab that's not quite as well known as the chair secret lab. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, what secrets are you guys up to? What are you labbing up in there? What are you brewing up? Well, uh, so my husband started a video game development company with his high school best friend back when they both finished their computing degrees. So this is the thing they're being very nice about is all my co-authors already have PhDs and they don't put doctor on the cover because otherwise I'd be the not Dr. Mars because I'm no. not finished yet. <laughs> but yeah, they all have PhDs. They mostly did like human computer interaction and like urban informatics -y stuff. Uh, and yeah, they made a, a video game company and it's actually Tasmania's oldest video game company. And video game companies, I've said that word too many times uh, in this <laughs> sentence, <laughs> but typically they don't live very long. Like it's a very gig economy. It sometimes gets like Hollywood where like a, a company will form to do a certain production, then they'll break off and they'll do something else. And right. um, if that one's not a hit, maybe they won't do anything else. Whereas they've been really stable. They've been running this company for like 14 years and they've made games and apps for like Australian children's television shows and for like Qantas, the airline. Mm -hmm. They did a bunch of like in-flight in games and stuff. And so they really made a niche for themselves in that they do have computer science PhDs. And they also did a lot of work in early education. And there was a niche when the iPad had just come out. Everyone went, oh, my goodness, this is amazing for kids that don't yet understand keyboards. Like they might not be so pre-literate children uh, to have like interactions with this digital sort of thing. Uh, how do we make games for people who can't read yet? that they recognize like shapes and colors, but you can't give them instructions. How can we give them a meaningful experience? And yeah, they actually made an early niche writing games for really, really little kids that then turned into a, a pretty great market of making children's educational games for all ages. And now even like they get contracted by companies to make games that are like educational about what they're doing. So like recently they wrote a game for the local power company where you play a quoll, which is a, a Tasmanian native animal who has broken into someone's house and is trying to make their power bill really high. And in doing so, you <laughs> learn all about like the different tariffs and what things consume the most power so that kids know if you leave that on, that's going to cost your parents lots of money, way more than leaving that other thing on. And right. so it's quite fun. Uh, and yeah, on the side, we write books. And um, <laughs> yeah, the other two of us... Uh, Co-authors are also generally contractors on basically all their projects just because we all work in the same office. Tasmania is a small place. There's only so many people in IT on our <laughs> island. It's the only office we that we could get. <laughs> so we just, uh, yeah, we do a bit of everything. Some of the contracts I've done with them have been like getting a contract from a not-for-profit to build a Minecraft world where kids can simulate natural disasters to learn about how you respond to a crisis and evacuate <laughs> or like. Uh, making a bunch of Swift playgrounds that show you how to like collect space junk and also teach you how to code in Swift that then like goes to National Science Week and the you big made science a, center. You made a space junk game? Well, it's it's like a code long activity, but yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, it's supposed to Is teach you about coding. Yeah. No, I think I just started my PhD and it was still very exciting. <laughs> It's still exciting, but like at that time, I was definitely like, that was all I did. I was telling everyone, oh my God, I started a space PhD. 
because I guess I thought that going into computer science was like an active choice to not go into space instead. And I, uh, mm. like I said, our, our island's very small. Our university doesn't have many courses, and I think they had just axed the astrophysics major just before I moved here. I was very sad, but I probably wouldn't have had the maths jobs. Let's be honest. <laughs> 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 I work with the astrophysicists oh. now and they're all very smart. <laughs> um so before jumping into that PhD, you did have a brief stint uh doing some kind of math stuff as a data science intern at the famous Australian graphic design platform Canva. You were working on design automation there. Yes. Um and then you also one of the other many things that you're currently doing now is you're also a unit design advisor for a post-grad mobile development course. Um, so is there a meaningful connection between artificial intelligence and these different kinds of user experience, uh, these user experience experiences that you have? Um, or is that is that something that just kind of happened randomly? It's just something that you've happened to specialize in. I feel like I've done this terrible thing to you, try to make you like, draw connections between my absolutely chaotic <laughs> career, which is just I do whatever I like <laughs> all the time. <laughs> uh, I went to Canva because I just finished uh, my honors, which is like a in Australia, if you do an undergraduate degree, it's only three years, not four years, but you can do an mm -hmm. extra fourth year that's like a mini master's. And once you've done mm -hmm. that, you can go straight into a PhD. Mm -hmm. And typically people do those just because to move to the US, you have to have done a four-year degree. So I had done that not because I was super passionate about research, but because I guess I was still <laughs> hiding in university and I want to have options. So I'd done that. And then I was like, okay, well, it's time to leave university and go out into the big brave world. And I just didn't want to. I wanted to do a PhD instead. <laughs> Everyone I knew had done a PhD and I didn't know if I really wanted to go into academia, but I just, I loved the freedom of being like a freelancer and a student and having those contracts where I just kind of do whatever work comes my way that I like. Like I, I, take contracts and all sorts of things like anyone on the island comes and goes you know computers come help me do blah with computers and it's always something totally chaotic and it's really fun i love that but i went i better give getting a normal human job a go so i went to the mainland is what they call it the, the big north island of australia <laughs> for a few months and i went i'll take an internship and i'll see how i feel about it and then if i like a job then i can save myself studying like four to seven more years and just get a job that'll be great but kind of fell to pieces like the canva was quite cool uh it's a cool platform and they had some really cool problems like i was on the design automation team which is like when someone adds an element to their design how can we have really smart defaults like when you add text what color is it going to be when you add a shape where is it going to be what size is it going to be when you go and like open the panel to search for something what are the, th the things that are going to be recommended and all of those things are impacted by what you've done so far in your design and even what you've done in previous designs. We want to learn how you make these designs so we can help make it for you because a, a big appeal of Canva is like it's not the Photoshop interface where you're just like shown all of these things all the time. It's supposed to be very transparent that it's making what you would have but in fewer steps because it knows you. And that's great. That was a really awesome experience. But it was also during the like Black Summer fires where you couldn't go outside without like a smoke mask on. And <laughs> my husband got a lung infection in like the first oh week. <laughs> and all these people who lived in Sydney, I guess, because like we're from the beautiful island of Tasmania that's all like pine forests. We have some of the cleanest air in the world. Actually, I think the northwest of Tasmania does scientifically have the cleanest air in the world. And so wow. we're really spoiled. So we went there and all the people who live in Sydney were still like walking around outside the apocalypse. And we were like, no, we're not leaving the apartment. And so it wasn't wasn't as fun, I guess. I, I think I had fun, but <laughs> I had no fun for not work reasons. Uh, right. And I came back to Tasmania. And we don't have as many big startups like that down here. Like I told you earlier that the iPad app Procreate is actually from Tasmania. Uh, it's made by a company called Savage Interactive. We have a few like really big web platforms down here. Like um, there's this kind of Canva for video type uh, company, Biteable, where you like make motion graphics and stuff it's like this online video editor they're down here as well but yeah they're they're all like 10 people so getting like a big startup job in tasmania is just not an option so you end up having wow. these chaotic freelancer careers. it sounds like <laughs> you have managed to forge for yourself in just your early career you're already doing so many 
different interesting projects that blend data and blend programming and writing and teaching. And uh, it sounds like you have a fabulous uh, career in Tasmania. Well, you can also avoid lung infections. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so it sounds pretty great. Maybe the best part. Um, so as a regular listener of the show, which I was delighted to learn uh, when we were talking before starting recording, uh, you are already aware that I always ask for a book recommendation near the end of the program. Yes. And so you actually had, you'd been thinking about this big stack of wonderful books that you'd put together, but you don't have that it was my, right my now. light Christmas reading was I decided to go back and read like all of the, the computer science greats. So I was going to read the, the dragon book of compilers and the MIT structure and interpretation of computer programs and uh, the, the secrets and lies about cryptography, which is really, really cool. Academia so suffers from people just trying to put their information on paper and not thinking about the narrative and the flow and the timbre. But Bruce Snyder is an absolutely amazing author. So even though I'm not into cryptography, he makes me be into cryptography because he's so interesting. Cool. And none of uh, those but... are my book recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your book recommendation, Mars? Uh, I decided that it would be one that I had physically in my office. So this is The Pattern on the Stone, The Simple Ideas That Make Computers Work by W. Daniel Hillis. Uh, good old W. Daniel. Not very big but is a little book that's about uh, kind of about how anything can be a computer. So basically they go through like, if we have these logic gates and this is how they can make decisions and this is how we can build up more complex logic. If we can do that with circuits, we could do that with pipes. We could do that with toothpicks. Uh, and it goes through how uh, these simple building blocks make something capable of complex logic and about how, the fundamentals of computing is not specific to electronics at all. It's just a method of decision making, which is really interesting. Uh, and I was I, I read this book entirely while in the waiting room for surgery last year for like it, it was it wasn't an emergency, but it was a medical thing. And so I guess I was like kind of a little bit medicated at the time. <laughs> <laughs> which made the book even better. I was just like, I came home to my husband. I was like, this is the best book I've ever read. Uh, and I've nice. read it again since. And it, it holds up, though maybe not quite as world changing. <laughs> <laughs> well, a great recommendation for all you stoner listeners out there. <laughs> um, so super fun. I've loved having you on the show, Mars. You are a brilliant communicator, which shouldn't Thank come as too much of a surprise given all of your teaching. You're also just a lot of fun to talk to on deeply technical topics. You really know your stuff. And so would love to have you on the show again someday. But in the meantime, how can listeners follow you online and keep up to date as you release the next in the series of your millions of books? <laughs> well, I, I did, made the decision to leave Facebook recently, which was actually great. It was fantastic for my mental health. Uh, but I'm still on Twitter. I'm a, t I'm a terrible Twitter gremlin, and my handle is at the Martian Life because I'm Mars the Martian. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm also on Mastodon on Oz.social, as in the Australian instance. What is Mastodon? Good. So Mastodon is like an open source federated alternative to Twitter. So the idea is so if you have oh. Twitter, you're all on the single platform, and all of your data right. lives on their servers. What yeah. if we went back to more of like a IRC model where you can host an instance of Mastodon, which is just some open source software that you can download mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. put it on your servers and people who like live near you or are part of your community, which might be like the academic community, it might be the telescope community or whatever that is, can join your instance. Only you hold their data and they can search people from other instances. So it creates like this big meta network. But the whole point was that it was supposed to give people more control because if you run your own instance or server, you can make community-specific rules and you can have community-specific jokes and conventions. And we find that these smaller groups actually end up with more meaningful interactions, like people post longer form and more personal things on there than they necessarily do Twitter. So yeah, they actually engage with it in quite a different way. That's cool. So I'm on Mastodon. It's very good. It's definitely less depressing than Twitter most days. Everyone's very nice. Um, I also have a website, which you take one look at and you're like, she wrote this in handcrafted HTML. And yes, I did because I my, my web dev skills are from the 90s. Uh, but I, I also believe that it's 
that's a good thing in that it's easy for a screen reader to read. It's easy for you to like scrape all of the styling out of and it still holds up as pure text. It, you can access it in a terminal text only browser on low data, everything. So I'm at themartianlife.com if you want to look at my incredibly retro website. <laughs> nice. And then you are on LinkedIn as well. I, want to I am, but there. I don't use it. I'm terrible. <laughs> Everyone's like, LinkedIn's the most important. I'm like, yeah. All the people I follow there are like, they're, they're researchers from uni. And it's just depressing yeah. watching like how hard they have to spruik themselves to get grants. <laughs> when I know this, how overworked they are, that they go home and they queue up LinkedIn posts or all this stuff. I'm like, just take a day off, man. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you do you. Uh, you definitely shouldn't uh, feel like you should be on LinkedIn. Uh, and it sounds like you're in enough places, especially Mastodon. That sounds super cool. Um, all right, Mars. It's been wonderful having you on the show. I look forward to catching to up be. again sometime in the future. I have to have another chaotic career change so I can be interesting to talk to again. Mars, why did you go into <laughs> manufacturing obscure plastics? I don't know. I don't know what my next <laughs> career change. I'm not moving from space. Who am I kidding? Space is the coolest. <laughs> nice. All right, we will uh, look forward to that manufacturing update. <laughs> uh, catch you then. Thanks for having me. What a brilliant person Mars is. It's staggering how many different topics from software to data science to space she can dive deep on. And she communicates so effectively too. What a treat it was to have her on the show today. In this episode, Mars filled us in on how synthetic data derived from simulations can provide us with infinite quantities of potentially very high quality data for training machine learning models. She talked about how bots from simulation engines such as Unity can be used to solve any problem expressed spatially, which could be literally any computational problem. She talked about how GPU programming with CUDA is essential to the high-performing computing needed for tracking space objects with radio telescopes, and how, if you're considering a career in academia, doing an internship in industry could be just what you need to convince yourself academic life is the better fit for you. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Mars's social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com 591. That's superdatascience.com slash 591. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel. I also encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by adding me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tagging me in a post about it. Your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. Thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana Siebert, Mario Pombo, Serge Massis, Sylvia Ogvang, and Kirill Aramenko on the Super Data Science team for managing, editing, researching, summarizing, and producing another fascinating episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon.